In previous videos in this series, I've looked at the subject of rust proofing using my old Discovery 1 as a test case. I've already done the surface preparation and have treated areas of active rust. However, I also came across areas of more deeply seated rust requiring structural repair, even though the vehicle has previously been given a clean bill of health by professionals who have worked on it. These repairs are the subject of today's video. Good afternoon, Bill the Engineer from Suffolk here. Now if you're wanting to see a masterclass on chassis welding, you've come to the wrong place. That isn't what this video is about. Seriously though, there's some excellent videos published by people who know far more about welding than I will ever know, and that's where you ought to look first. In the famous words of Clint Eastwood in Dirty Harry, a man ought to know his limitations, I know mine, and I'm not going to give a welding lesson. That being said, Towards the back end of this video, I am going to give some fabrication advice because somehow the experts often seem to miss out on the sorts of problems and issues which we face in the real world when welding up old vehicles like this. The main thrust of the video will be to use engineering principles to develop a rational approach to repairing and reinforcing chassis. I see videos out there of people doing this work and I have to say, I often don't understand what the hell they're doing, and I'm sure they don't. I want to understand the sorts of forces and stresses that the chassis sees, and we can then decide what the best reinforcement is to apply. So if you're ready, we'll go inside and I'll boot up the computer. I'm now going to look at the typical loads and stresses taken by the main chassis members, using the Discovery as an example. Now this is of necessity a technical subject and if that's not to your taste you can jump ahead three or four minutes in the video. I have tried to lighten it a bit by taking a slightly humorous approach but I do assure you that the information presented is completely valid and it would stand up in court my lord. Now I want to have a 30 second course on structural engineering so you can understand what I'm trying to do. And basically, I want to understand the behaviour of the main chassis rails. Now, these are just simple beams. The simplest example of a beam is what we have here. It's what's called simply supported. So it sits on a hinge support at either end and it's loaded in the centre. And there are basically two force systems, or what we call stress resultants, uh, to be resisted. This is what's known as a shear force. And all it says is that the, the support reaction here must be transmitted along this section of the beam to the center to support the load. And because of the sign convention, we have a change of sign here, and we have an equal and opposite shear force going out to the other support. But apart from this, we also have the bending moment. Now, the bending moment is zero to either end because it's on hinge supports. But as you move away from the support, the product of this end reaction and this distance here means that the bending moment increases until we get to a maximum value in the center. And the whole point is that the beam must develop an internal stress system to resist both the shear force and the bending moment. And if you've understood that, you know enough for us to move forward. Now, when I say that the externally applied forces need to be resisted by internal stress systems, what do I mean? I have here an example of a rectangular hollow section, which happens to be the same as the main chassis rails in a Land Rover, or indeed in many other 4x4s. And to get the terminology right, the horizontal plates at the top and the bottom, what we call flanges, and the vertical plates at the side are what we call webs. Now firstly, considering the applied men, uh, bending moment, this is resisted by equal and opposite internal stresses acting longitudinally along the beam. And we have compressive stresses in the top and tensile stresses in the bottom. And the maximum stresses occur at the extreme outer fibres of the cross section. We also find that by far the greatest contribution to the bending moment comes from the top and the bottom flanges and for all practical purposes, we can ignore the contribution coming from the two webs. Now, considering the shear forces, 
This is resisted by a system of stresses which act parallel to any cross-section through the beam. And the magnitude is such that it's zero at the top and the bottom, rising to a maximum in, in the center. We also find that the contribution to the shear force from the top and the bottom flanges is almost negligible. And by far the biggest contribution comes from the two webs. And in practice, you normally just design the webs to resist the total shear force. We now turn our attention to the vehicle, or more specifically, uh, to the main chassis rails. And our starting point is the information in the owner's manual, both the dimensions and the maximum axle loads, which turn out to be 1,200 kilograms at the front, 1,650 at the rear, although we are only interested in the sprung weights because the chassis doesn't see the unsprung items. Now, we don't know how this load is distributed along the chassis, and I've assumed that we have a uniformly distributed load of one magnitude over the front half of the vehicle and another magnitude at the rear. So this is W1 measured in kilograms per meter and that's W2. However, we don't know the values of W1, W2 and we need to establish them before we can go any further. Now I occasionally have engineering students logging into this channel, so maybe they can help me. What we need to know is we need to know the distributed load on the chassis rails commensurate with the known axle forces, the shear force bending moment diagrams, and we also need to know the bending and shear stresses in the chassis rails. But the rule is, must be derived from first principles. No computer analysis allowed. Prize, I'm prepared to give a bag of toffees for the first successful solution. Now the next stage is to look at the properties of the chassis members. And we have here the Land Rover chassis member, 150 deep, 75 wide, wall thickness 2mm everywhere. I think this is very typical of many 4x4s. And we need to calculate the section properties, both the shear properties and the bending properties. And the purpose of this it gives the relationship between the applied shear force and bending moment and the resulting stresses caused in the section. Now let's turn our attention to the shear forces and shear stresses. Now with the help of my kind engineering students, we were able to calculate the distributed loads acting on the chassis rails, 512 kilograms per metre on the front half, 665 on the rear half, and these will give rise to the known axle loads. And from this we can compute the shear force diagram by definition starts at zero at the free end, rises to a local maximum and local minimum at the front spring carrier, and here rises to an absolute maximum just in front of the rear spring carrier, a local minimum back to zero. Now up here we have maximum shear force of 825 kilograms. We already know the shear area and this gives us an average shear stress in the webs of 13.5 newtons per millimeter squared. But what's this actually mean? If we look at a permissible stress design code like BS449, we see that the permissible shear stress for mild steel is 100 newtons per millimeter squared. And this means our stress ratio or the utilization is only 13.5%, uh, not very high. Likewise, let's look at the bending moments and bending stresses in the beam. I show here the computed bending moment diagram, and let me explain how it works. At the front end of the vehicle, starts off at zero, goes to a local minimum at the front spring carrier. When I say minimum, this is considered to be a neg negative bending moment because with the deflected shape of the beam, it's convex upwards. On the other side of the spring carrier, the bending moment reduces, changes sign, and goes to a maximum value in mid-span. And from here onwards, it reduces. We get another local minimum, the rear spring carrier, and back to zero at the free end. Now in the middle, the maximum bending moment is 277 kilogram meters. We already know section properties, hence we can compute the maximum bending stress has a value of 75 newtons per millimeter squared. 
the permissible bending stress for mild steel in accordance with the design code is 165 newtons per millimeter squared so the stress ratio or utilization is 45 percent and we would consider that this is moderately stressed I now want to interpret the findings of my little analysis and see what it actually means for the type of reinforcing we're going to apply to a rusty chassis. But I also need to head off one question first. You may all ask, what about the dynamic loading on the chassis rails? I've just done a static analysis. Now the more I would load for you may have noticed I've taken the full load of a fully loaded vehicle and applied all of that to one chassis rail. And this is the equivalent of applying half of that load to one chassis rail and then increasing that by a dynamic amplification factor of two. It's in the right ballpark and it's perfectly good enough for the purpose of this video. So what do I conclude from this? Well I have to say that the calculated stresses are very much what I would have predicted. The shear stresses in the webs are low but this is normally the case in most structural engineering situations and the bending stresses in the top and bottom flanges are, are moderate. Overall, um, it's a conservatively designed section with a bit of contingency. It will withstand some wastage of material without overstressing, maybe 25-30%. But also the same box section can be used in a longer wheelbase vehicle, something like the Defender 110. I fully understand how the designers have sized it. But what does this tell us about any welded repairs? Well, for the webs, i.e. the side plates, almost any competently laid weld will be adequate to transmit the surrounding stresses, no problem. In the top and bottom flanges, you do want to restore the full strength of the surrounding material. And most commonly, this will be done with a butt weld. If it's a single-sided butt weld, you do have difficulty in ensuring you get full penetration and I would advocate leaving a bit of well reinforcement. The crown of the weld should be proud of the surrounding material. Don't be too aggressive with the grinder. On the other hand, if you're using lap plates, this will be attached by fillet welds. There are rules for sizing the fillet welds, but that's beyond the scope of this video. And finally, the longitudinal seam welds in the top and bottom flanges well, they don't have a lot of work to do. They are parallel with the direction of the principal stresses. So if you've got some corrosion there, grind out the rust and lay a nice uh, seam weld to seal it, but it doesn't have to be a full strength butt weld. Next point. If you're using reinforcing plates, don't use plates which are thicker than the original wall thickness provided by the manufacturer. For my current project, I bought two mil plates and they're perfectly adequate. Now I see examples out there on the internet and people use five mil, six mil plates. I want to scream. There's no point in it. In fact, there's very good reason not to do it. And that's because big, thick, heavy plates will have big, thick, heavy welds, which is not only expensive, but also is going to have attendant problems, things like welding distortion. Now there's a well-respected YouTube channel there by a New Zealand publisher. The guy was grafting a new rear end onto a series Land Rover. He aligned it very carefully, but he did have heavy reinforcement on, which meant large unbalanced welds. And by the time he finished welding it, it had pulled the chassis out of alignment by more than 15 millimetres. Final footnote. I spent my working life in the oil industry designing and building offshore platforms, mainly on fixed price contracts, and if we had oversized welds, that was your profit up in smoke. So use the correct weld size, make the weld soundly, and you'll be absolutely fine, no problem at all. So what I want to do now, I'll look at cases where people have kindly published details about their chassis repairs on the internet and I'll make my own comments about them both the good points and the bad points now we got a guy here who's grafting a new rear end onto the back of his truck so we got a big splice right in the middle of the chassis and he's done a big Z profile cut right through the main chassis members I'll come back to this in a few minutes 
Now the chassis members themselves suppress steel C-sections and that's good because it means you can get to both sides of the weld. Now he's done a butt weld all the way around, across the top and bottom flanges and all the way down the zigzag path on the web. We show here a view on the top flange. We got well reinforcement on top and if he cares to get in behind, clean up the route, make sure there's full penetration, if necessary lay another bead, then this will count as a full strength butt weld. But hey, what's he done here? There's a very large fish plate or cheek plate as it's sometimes called on the side of the web. The weld is big and strong although rather untidy. Now this I simply don't understand because the shear stresses in the web simply aren't going to be very high and if you're going to put a reinforcing plate anywhere you ought to put it in the top and bottom flanges. Now another comment I would like to make regards the location of the splice joint. Now do you remember we calculated the bending moment and shear force diagrams for the discovery and this is typical of any 4x4. So we start at zero here at the front of the vehicle. We've got the front spring carrier, mid span, rear spring carrier and rear of the vehicle. Now where this guy's done his splice, he's gone into the mid span here where the bending moment and the bending stresses are going to be highest. And furthermore, the shear force is going to be very low, maybe even zero. So the work he's done on reinforcing the web absolutely heroic but I have to say completely futile and a small hint if you are locating a splice in the midsection of a chassis ideal place to go go in about a quarter of the span either from the front or the rear spring carrier the bending moments are going to be low and indeed if you can find the points of contraflexure they will be zero my final comment regards the use of the Z-shaped cut used for the main splice joints. And these seem to be quite popular actually. And if they're not used, people often seem to use these angled cuts. And this comes from a video entitled The Correct Way to Shorten a Truck Chassis. Now I assure you that these angle welds are no stronger than simple perpendicular welds. And they are a great deal more work. They are simply never ever used in the structural fabrication industry. I wonder why. Now the next one concerns corroded chassis rail on a Toyota 4Runner. Seem to be a few of them around. And this is being done by a commercial auto repair outfit. And they made up a template to cover the corroded area. Cut out a reinforcing plate which they laid on top and have attached it by a fillet weld around the edge. This is rather messy, isn't it? And we'll need an awful lot of tidying up. And also, I hope they remember to weld it along here because this is where the local axle loads come in. Now, I would never ever do this. I would cut out the corroded steel and I'd carefully profile the reinforcing plate and let it in and attach it by a butt weld. By laying it over the top, you create a corrosion trap and even the new steel is going to corrode in double quick time. However, the repair shop explained their philosophy. The customer wants as cheap a job as possible, and even the way they've done it, it will last for the rest of the vehicle's life. And I do understand that. And they finally dressed it off with some sort of glass fibre coating, and they again put under seal over the top. Again, I wouldn't do that, because all you're doing is you're covering up the repair, and you can't see signs of any further distress. But so be it. So that's it for today. I think this video is quite long enough already. In the next video, we'll talk about some practical fabrication aspects. Now, I'm not a qualified coded welder, but there are a number of pointers which aren't actually covered in other videos. So I'll see you then. Bill the Engineer, signing off.